friends, uh, welcome to this program on Introduction to Instructional Design. This is part of the MDE 412 Instructional Design course. This is an introductory uh, to instructional design and we'll study more uh, through different videos and from the MDE 412 course. We will uh, discuss uh, very preliminary uh, uh, introductory uh, concepts and uh, um, ideas about instructional design and whether you are teaching in a school or you are teaching in a college or university or any training organization, uh, you would find it useful that how you would uh, design your instruction. Instructional design is a discipline now, it is being considered and it is certainly a science. We will try to distinguish between teaching and instruction and proceed that uh, different uh, aspects of instructional design including the characteristics, the processes, and uh, at the end, uh, I will give you an example that uh, how a design is being done practically. So let me proceed to distinguish between teaching and instruction. As you see on your screen, teaching is a larger concept. It's a very broader concept. Teaching involves uh, values, perspectives, sometimes ideology of the teacher. And uh, teaching encompasses both formal, informal, as well as what happens within the course and even outside the course, including the students' uh, learning experiences, engaging with the teacher. But instruction is very specific because it depends on the learning outcomes and the way it has been designed, and therefore the teacher follows the instructional processes. But uh, insofar as teaching is concerned, that one can go beyond instruction and make it more multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and so on and so forth. As you see on your screen, that uh, teaching I've taken from a website that I have given there, but changed a little bit uh, to suit our uh, context over here, that teaching is basically guiding students generally, and instruction is uh, uh, generally concerned with giving direct instructions to the students based on the instructional design. Two, the teaching is for overall personality development of the students and therefore a lot more outside instruction would come in in the name of multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity. On the other hand, instruction is for development of skills and competencies generally concerned with the school, which is concerned with both discipline competency, theory, as well as practice in terms of competencies when the discipline gets applied or the area of study or the subject or the paper gets applied into context. Three, teaching is largely concerned with developing critical thinking, reflective thinking and so on and so forth, whereas uh, instruction it arouses functional thinking that how to apply that to a particular context. Four, that teaching goes beyond prescribed syllabus as I said earlier, but uh, in, in case of instruction we can find to specified context and outcomes. Five, Teaching deals with transmitting almost anything, concepts, ideas, theories, um, historical developments, and so on and so forth. The, the contour of the subject that we teach. But instructional basically deals with a set of tools and tasks to do something very specific, and therefore it will be concerned with more the trajectory or the way it is being done. Next, teaching uh, provokes all the time. Teaching raises questions which may may not be solved within the classroom or in a teaching learning context, but in terms of instruction, it, it, it prescribes. So it, it provides guidelines to follow, but teaching goes beyond guidelines to, to articulate more on the part of the students and therefore engagement of the teacher with the students. And finally, and there could be many more, but finally, teaching is uh, all about uh, liberating. Teaching has freedom, education has freedom. So teaching deals with that, liberating the human beings to go beyond what is being taught or transacted within or outside the classroom. But instruction is regimentation in the sense that we confine ourselves to the prescribed the design that we have developed for a particular period of study or particular classroom teaching or particular chunk of coursework called the modules. Just to give you an idea, as you see on your screen, uh, the relationship between curriculum, pedagogy, and learning theory, and within that, instruction is located or teaching is located. Basically, as you see, that curriculum is uh, uh, setting out the aims and objectives in related to students' learning. So broadly, the curriculum prescribes what is going to be taught 
and what intent it has or what impact it is intended to have on the students and it will also include both formal informal experiences of the students to bring into the educational discourses. So curriculum is much broader a concept. But uh, when curriculum gets transacted into action, the pedagogy guides the curriculum. The pedagogy provides the strategies to meet the educational aims and objectives. And strategies could be individualized strategies, group strategies, they could be inductive or deductive strategies and so on and so forth. I will mention a little bit later about the strategies. Whereas the learning theories, so curriculum, pedagogy and learning theories, the learning theories, they inform the design of the pedagogy and pedagogy provides the functional strategies for how a curriculum will be transacted. So this is basically a relationship between curriculum, pedagogy and learning and instruction cuts across all the three because instructional design is part of the curriculum design and instructional design takes into consideration what perspective will be taken in terms of pedagogic perspectives and learning theories of pedagogic strategies and learning theories will be informing that part of the instruction. As you see on the screen, hopefully you can read it, that this is the relationship between curriculum, pedagogy and technology for instance. So, so as you see on your screen that uh, the pedagogy is a holistic conception of how teaching learning is, uh, is, uh, is conceived and transacted or organized. So it is a larger uh, holistic conception of how it will be done. Whereas number one, the teaching learning strategies will be basically dominance of a perspective that a teacher would take from a behavioristic perspective or a cognitivist perspective or a constructivist pr perspective or from the point of view of a social learning or situated perspective or even a socio-cultural learning perspective. So the perspective to pedagogy is provided by the learning theories. Number two, uh, in the red box that you will see, this is all about instructional design and instructional design is basically the strategy which translates, uh, if I, basically with the strategy which translates the pedagogy into action. This is a design only, when it gets transacted, it becomes an instructional strategy. So instructional design is design of what is going to be transacted and when it gets transacted, we take the help of various instructional strategies to transact that instruction or teaching and learning. Uh, I have divided instructional design into two parts in the box, right hand side top box, that instructional design models and uh, instructional theories. So um, uh, you will study in other video programs about instructional design models and instructional design models could be about uh, describing pedagogic strategy, for instance, behaviorism, cognitivism, or for that matter, again, as nine uh, um, uh, events of instruction. It could also be guided by quality of instruction, like uh, David Merrill's uh, principles of instruction. It could also be guided by enhancing design of learning, like uh, um, self-regulated learning or even learning styles, etc. It could also be uh, decided or designed through the models of uh, change management, for instance, means works of taxonomy of organizational change. It could also be guided by the learning environment. I have given the example of Sandberg's uh, learning environment functions and so on and so forth. It could also be informed by the instructional theories. Instructional theories like concept attainment, advanced organizer, concept mapping, role playing and so on and so forth. It could be inductive uh, in the sense that uh, the student's learning experiences in context, on ground, um, in practical context would be uh, informing the, 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 the learning, learning processes and the learning outcomes and therefore it is inductive, it comes from below from the learners and it could be deductive sometimes. Um, as, as you see, uh, the next is a cooperative, which is about social learning, collaborative learning, peer-to-peer -peer learning, and cooperative learning. All these are part of that and could also be direct instruction, which generally we do, say for instance, through um, teacher demonstration, teacher lecture, um, and, and, and student practice and discussion within the classroom, and so on and so forth. 
Three, that you will see the pedagogic method. So pedagogy, number one, the strategies or the learning theories informing that. Two, the instructional design that we are discussing. And three, about pedagogic methods, which will be basically the, 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 the method that we undertake to transact that curriculum or transact that course of study. It could be present, direct presentation, exhibition demos, drill and practice, tutorials, games, storytelling, simulation, role playing, discussion, interaction, modeling, um, sometimes computer modeling or mental modeling, and collaborative learning, cooperative learning, debates, field trips, apprenticeship, uh, um, uh, like internships case study, problem-based learning and project-based learning. Basically, the problem-based learning and the last project-based learning are more constructivist insofar as instructional design is concerned. The characteristics of instructional design could be, could be considered from three points of view, as you see on your screen, that instructional design is a process. It's a process of doing things doing your teaching and learning. Teaching learning will be your, including your course of study, your teaching learning strategies, your media instruction, information and communication technology, the activities that you design, the way you would like to engage your students, and finally, formative and summative assessment and transfer of learning to actual context of practice. So as a process, it is instructional specific learning theories. So learning theories, behaviorism, cognitivism, constructivism, even to the connectivism, which is a learning theory, digital learning theory for 21st century, Professor George Simon, all are referring to instructional design as a process. It could also be considered as a science because it is a practical application of uh, objective and scientific process of designing, developing, delivering, evaluating situations that facilitate learning. Basically, learning is all about engaging students in practical contexts through uh, gaining their own experience and bringing it back to discourse, to teaching and learning, including group discussion, peer, uh, student, uh, teacher interaction, and so on and so forth, which can be offline in the classroom, which can also be online uh, on the semantic web. Three, that uh, it is being considered as a discipline because the student background is very important. It is uh, considered as a discipline, as a branch of knowledge dealing with research and theory about instructional strategies and instructional processes. We have seen in the box before, the instructional strategies could be informed by a varieties of behavioristic and other uh, uh, theories and the instructional process, the way it is being transacted within or outside the classroom. So friends, the basic principles that we should consider while designing an instruction uh, are quite a few. So I have listed uh, as much as possible practically from the experience that uh, these are, uh, these should be considered whether you are teaching within the classroom or at a distance or the school, college or university or even in a training context. Any kind of resources that you've designed for formal teaching and learning or formal training should consider, from my point of view, should consider these. One, that effective pacing for students, that, uh, that the material should be paced in such a way that students find it comfortable, that they would like to proceed uh, at ease. Multiple pathways, supplementary resources should be provided. So for instance, the third point, remedial materials as well as enriching materials. Remedial materials for those who are proceeding slow and enriching materials for those who would like to go beyond in their cognitive strategy to higher order learning and therefore both kinds of materials should be put as supplementary to the main resources that we are providing either through lecture or through self-learning material or a video program or a conferencing or an online um, group interaction for instance. Clarity in format of the materials, the format has to be such both the formatting which includes copy editing, the formatting of the materials as well as the way they have been organized and presented, including simple language. Structure and linkage, it is very important that from time to time, not only we give at the beginning a concept mapping and an advanced organizer, but also from time to time, we also provide linkage to different materials within the same course and sometimes outside the course or a linkage to a YouTube uh, video or linkage to a website or linkage to an open education resource materials.
activity and the practice, which is very important. I will talk about that a little more, that uh, whatever we teach, the theory must be practiced in, in context. Therefore, the students must be provided with activities and enough space and enough credit hours so that they, within the course, are able to practice whatever is being taught. And therefore, student engagement in activity is very important. We must enrich new experiences and link to existing experience. So whatever the students have, and therefore, group discussion or discussion in a disc online discussion forum these are very important because the students bring their experience and the four which are very very crucial and because if you consider their experience and if your teaching is based on their experiences there is more possibility of internalizing your teaching by them and therefore a cognitive transformation will take place and assimilation will take place and there is more possibility that the, the transfer of learning to the context of application would be enhanced. The, it should, we must provide collaborative, engaging, community-based uh, uh, strategies whereby the student and student can interact, students and others can interact, student and materials can interact, and students and teachers can interact. There should be always a peer evaluation and feedback because students learn from each other much more than what they will be learning by self or this is what is called a social constructivist way of learning. The culture is very important, that uh, cultural context because we all operate, think through our own culture including our language which is a mother tongue language. We, we think in mother tongue and speak in different languages. So that is very important, peer evaluation and feedback. So encourage originality, creativity, innovation in ideas. If we give students, say for instance, through a problem-based learning and especially a project-based learning or especially a portfolio. These days we are talking about portfolio offline and e-portfolio online. All these contribute to students bringing their originality and creativity. For instance, uh, uh, reflective teaching would like to bring in, which uh, we have been stretching a lot, that a blogging, for instance, a blog is an individual way of reflecting and wiki is a collaborative engagement and collaborative way of reflecting. So blog and wiki, which are part of the online discourse, could also be brought into our teaching and learning, even if we are teaching within the classroom. We must relate to real life experiences and social experiences. Social and life skills are very important and therefore we must uh, connect to social and life experiences because our theoretical teaching within and outside the classroom has been more dominated by a uh, lot of theory uh, uh, devoid of uh, their application into social and life context. And therefore it is very important not only we relate to social and life experiences but also we design such that within the course, we, within our instruction or teaching, we develop social and life skills within that. So, the, like the choice best credit system, for instance, that you would notice that uh, there is a discipline competency, there is an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary competency, there is also social life skill competency, and the fourth, there is a job related vocational or professional competency. All these four competencies must be uh, joining together. This is what is called a 21st century learning and 21st century learning experiences. Develop a critical thinking, therefore we must always relate to a problem or project or to a discovery, leaving students through individual and collaborative projects that they should do themselves and discover something new. And read skills of learning to learn and lifelong learning and therefore we must develop skills in the students that they would continue uh, learn for the whole lifetime and therefore immediate and delayed feedback is very important. Immediate which is much more possible in a fast paced context, so also online is possible. Delayed feedback within the classroom and in online context are also required. The psychological principles as we were discussing earlier, the behaviorist, cognitivist and constructivist, these are the perspectives that uh, come to the picture when a teacher undertakes design of the instruction and more particularly translating that instruction into practice which we would call as teaching per se or facilitating students learning. If you are taking a behavioristic position you are simply considering that the students must repeat, there must be re reinforcement and feedback, there should be reward and therefore an external transformation as they say the student uh, uh, mind is a tabula rasa and therefore a teacher has to teach, therefore the students have to learn. This is a position that the behaviorism takes. 
Cognitivists would say that a whole lot of 90% or even more of the student's uh, characteristics or mental structure is within, only 10% is visible that we are dealing with. Therefore, we need to engage students or learners in cognitive structure in the learning process. So their mental thinking, reasoning, um, all kinds of things that uh, uh, happen, including discovery, problem solving, all these must be uh, undertaken and therefore the students would be in a position to engage in their own cognitive structure which is much more inside and less visible. Constructivist would take a position that uh, well that we can teach as a teacher we can provide resources for self-learning but learners generate their own understanding and their own experience and they interpret personally. So their personal interpretation and therefore discussion, group discussion or online discussion forum, group discussion is very important that we need to appreciate each other's understanding and therefore collaborative engagement is very important. To distinguish between behaviorism and constructivism, as you see that uh, behaviorist would be an instructivist and uh, constructivism would be a constructivity. Instructivist that we present and constructivist that the students create their own meaning. Behaviorist would be more abstract teaching, constructivism believes in concrete things. This believes in mastery learning and uh, constructivism would stress more on experiential learning and so on and so forth. So in, in behaviorism, we are, we are a teacher or an instructor, but when it comes to constructivism, facilitating students to construct their own idea and engage among themselves as well as with the teacher to discover that what is new and what can be applied to practically in the context that they are in. So left hand side, it, teacher is an instructor, right hand side, teacher becomes a facilitator. As I was talking about the instructional design models in the figure that you will refer back that the red I said instructional design and therefore the model. The model that we were discussing which is a pedagogic strategy. So Robert Gane gave us nine events of instruction. If you are following Robert Gane, we could consider all these and enrich your teaching and learning. First, gain attention that we must provide context, even if it is a self-learning material, that we must provide something at the beginning, create a problem, create a scenario, create a situation to gain their attention. Or else, we can also tell students that they should share the experience at the beginning, that what do they think about this? This will gain their attention. And you can also build on what the students are saying. Two, that inform objectives or outcomes and today we are talking about outcome based learning and uh, generally we have been dominated by Bloom's taxonomy but there are others also which can guide us and Robert Garnet has also given uh, uh, defined different types of uh, objectives, learning objectives and learning outcomes. Recall prior learning we must always connect to the previous learning. Present materials in such a way in simple language, in engaging language, in conversational language and therefore the students find it ease to study. We must all the time provide guidance, facilitate it through multi-examples, through different notes, different boxes, case studies and so on and so forth. Elicit performance, we should give some self-test in between that the students are able to do it and if you can extend that into a small activity that will be very highly appreciated. Always provide feedback, immediate as well as delayed. We must assess the performance because at the end of the instruction, there must be tests, uh, varieties of tests, uh, which can facilitate assessing the students and enhance the reflection as well as transfer of learning. And this is last point is most important, that your teaching and learning should be more reflective and they should translate into action. So designing an instruction, you are considering the learning environment, classroom or outside, or a network-based learning, resources, including digital resources, teaching learning, actual teaching learning, interaction, how the students will be engaging in different activities and interacting among themselves, assessment, both formative and summative assessment, and how learning should be transferred into the actual uh, world of work through, for instance, portfolios. Portfolio is an important strategy to ensure that the students gain experience, record that, and translate or transfer that into their world of work. The com common uh, pedagogic strategies that we uh, adopt, either you are teaching face-to-face, -face, distance, online or blended, how to transmit information, 
how to create interaction, collaboration within the classroom, even online, how to provide high order metacognitive learning through reflective strategies, and finally, how to facilitate that the student's experience is enhanced um, because they assimilate more. These five are applicable to any kind of teaching learning that we are talking about. When you design an instruction, design a program for that matter, it involves design, development, delivery, maintenance, evaluation, and final revision. Whether you are teaching face-to-face -face in a school, college, or university, or at a distance, or through online and blended learning, these are applicable to all. Take for example that uh, uh, we, what are the factors that contribute to our design of curriculum and instruction? Needs analysis, national regional development needs, human resource requirements in the country and elsewhere, global developments, uh, expert opinion, discipline knowledge structure, research and development uh, in that area, the indigenous knowledge base, faculty expertise, learner profile, social expectation, you can even more add more. If not all, some of these or all of these can contribute to your deciding what to teach and how to teach. Two very important aspects, what to teach and how to teach. These will be translated into a program blueprint, which uh, is, we would call, it should be based on concept mapping. You will study more about concept mapping. Concept mapping, different kinds of concept mapping could contribute finally outcome of a blueprint, and that concept mapping will be translated, the right hand side top box, translated into credit hours and learning outcomes, which will be combination of knowledge, attitude, 21st century skills, employability skills, and so, social and life skills, and so on and so forth. While doing this, side by side, we must translate learning outcomes into activities that the student should be engaged. For all these, we'll be providing learning resources, including a teacher's teaching or a video program or a teleconferencing, or online teaching and learning resources, open education resources, YouTube videos, and so on and so forth. Social uh, networks and social technologies could also be brought in. These will be telling us how to decide about our teaching learning strategies. We also build in formative and summative assessment, deliver the program within the classroom, outside the classroom, do a program evaluation, and finally, we undertake program revision. These, in other terms, is applicable, uh, is visible on your screen, starting from a graduate attribute and learning outcomes, and take into consideration the existing learning experiences. And your course design, instructional design, should be modular, credit-based, and resource-based, self-learning and collaborative learning. Also, mediated teaching and learning, a 21st century employable skills, metacognitive skills, self-regulated learning skills. We must give authentic tasks, engaging students in the world of work. There should be case studies, workshops, extended contact programs, portfolios, internships, you can think of more. And finally, the assessment rubric should be authentic, comprehensive and continuous, formative and summative, all the time, continuously going on. And there should be weightage, grading or score given to each task that we do, minor tasks that we do. And it should be authentic because it should be related to the world of work or to the social context that the students are engaged in. In other words, the curriculum mapping or the concept mapping uh, would be leading to learning outcomes, uh, which will be deciding the kinds of activities that we'll be designing to meet those learning outcomes and authentic tasks, how to assess those. In between is your teaching learning strategies, different media that you will bring in, open education resources that you will bring in, self-learning materials that you will be using, handbooks, handouts, and all kinds of things that you use. Therefore, to graphically represent your learning outcome one, activity one, assessment one. Learning outcome two, activity two, assessment two. Learning outcome three, activity three, assessment three. This will make it more authentic and more, more authoritative both for the students as well as for the teachers and for anybody including the employer or even for that matter the accrediting agency or assessment agency could also do that and in case of international credit transfer this will facilitate the credit transfer between institutions within the country and outside the country. Just to give an example to conclude uh, my presentation just to give an example from physics uh, this is about uh, uh, Newton's uh, law of motion. 
Just to give an example how this has been translated into action. I have taken this from uh, the BSc Physics of Indira Gandhi National Open University, which is an excellent uh, uh, organization of instructional design or learning design that they have done. On the left hand side, you know, uh, top box, you will see that these two learning outcomes have been defined. Based on that, the, the important laws, definitions in boxes that have been given, the top below box, Newton's first law of motion, which led to design of an activity A, B, C, what causes things to move. So here is a linkage between learning outcomes, the definition and conceptual clarification, linked to an activity, leading to further activities and examples on Newton's law of motion, and giving a self-assessment question within the text or within your presentation within the classroom, leading to unit and questions that when you complete your lecture or your unit, self-learning unit, an online discussion forum and an online presentation, the 5.6, for instance, unit and questions, all about the law of motion, Newton's law of motion, and finally, in examination, that how in a one and a half hour examination, the question A deals with the law of motion. So friends, to conclude the example that I have given, which talks about, if I go back, which talks about the learning outcomes, conceptual clarity, linking to an activity that the students will do, further explanation and examples, and uh, self-assessment questions for the students to do and check whether they have learned or not, unit and questions or the lecture and questions that the students can do and find out to what extent uh, they have learned and teacher would also find it out. This could also be forming part of your assessment and finally an examination question. So friends, to conclude, I must say in this program, we have uh, talked about the foundational principles of instructional design, uh, different models you will start study later and uh, how the characteristics, the functions, the processes of instructional design and uh, uh, when you do a curriculum design and uh, transact uh, instruction through instructional design models that you'll be using, some examples that I've given and finally an example through New Newton's motion of law that how learning outcomes have led to further conceptual explanations, have led to uh, students doing an activity and come to a self-assessment question and finally your lecture end or the unit end questions and finally in the exam paper. Thank you very much indeed.